see. They despoiled the great city of Babylon and enslaved the tribes of Israel. Even the pharaoh of Egypt paid them tribute. Their army became the largest yet seen, their warriors the greatest, and their warfare the cruelest. In September of 655 BC, an Assyrian army sets off from its base in southern Iraq. Its target, Elam, a kingdom on the Persian Gulf. Boldly, the Elamites march from their city, cross the river that divides them from their foe, and prepare to do battle. At daybreak, the first Assyrians come into view. Like a storm gathering, thousands of horses and men assemble. The signal for attack is sounded, and the chariots charge. By day's end, the river runs red with the blood of animals and men the blood of Elamites. In their hour of victory, the Assyrians are proud and cruel. I cut their throats like lambs. I cut off their precious lives as one cuts a stream. Like the many waters of a storm, I made the contents of their gullets and entrails run down upon the wide earth. My prancing steeds plunged into the streams of blood and filth. With the bodies of their warriors, I filled the plain like grass. Among the victims, the Elamite king. Tuman, king of Elam, fled to save his life and hid in a wood. The crossbar of his royal transport broke and it overturned on him. In desperation, he said to his son, Use your bow! Tuman's son tried to save him, to no avail. The king was caught and beheaded. The trophy was taken to the Assyrian king, who slashed it and spat on it. Then he hung it on a tree for all to see, while he celebrated his victory with a banquet. Tuman's followers suffered no less. Some were made to grind up the bones of their dead. Others were flayed alive. When the Assyrian king returned to Nineveh, his artisans immortalized the triumphs of his war machine. In room after room of his cavernous palace, they glorified his butchery. Men impaled on spikes, eyes put out, heads cut off. To ambassadors from distant realms, the writing on the wall was clear. The great Assyrian army arose from humble origins, a small state surrounding the holy city of Asher, from which they drew their name. Well situated in the rain belt of what would become northern Iraq, Assyria grew up on the fertile banks of the river Tigris, a kingdom as prosperous as the land. 
But these plains, so inviting to be tilled, beckon to be plundered. In one hand, a farmer needed his plowshare. In the other, a sword. By 1000 BC, Assyria, long a vassal to other kings, had tired of the foreign yoke. As regent of the gods on earth, the king of Assyria was divinely sanctioned to wage war. Ashur, father of the gods, empowered me to depopulate and repopulate, to make broad the boundary of the land of Assyria. Assyria began to enlarge its borders, but with each change of seasons, the empire withered. When autumn came, soldiers returned to their fields, and rebellion sprouted. In 745 BC, a new king took the throne and changed history. Tiglath-Pileser III vowed to make Assyria forever strong with a standing army. Encouraged by the prospects of a career in arms, thousands of young men enlisted. Tiglath-Pileser created all the institutions these soldiers would need, starting with an armory. To provide proper arrangements for the camp, to look after the steeds, the mules, the chariots, the battle equipment, and the enemy booty. Iron was the backbone of the army. Each soldier was issued a conical iron helmet, a sturdy breastplate of interlocking strips of bronze, and strong leather boots. The tallest men served as spear carriers, wielding an iron-tipped lance. When they locked with their foe, they would reach for their dagger. Some soldiers became archers. Some carried no weapon at all. Their role was to protect other warriors. They gave cover to archers with shields four feet high, hammered out of leather, faced with bronze, or plated with wicker work. At the festival of the new year, the king inspected his army to ensure it was always ready to fight. Fed, clothed, and armed at his expense, the Assyrian warriors became the most professional army the world had yet seen. Well equipped as they were, the Assyrians sought more, horses for their chariots, iron for weapons, timber for siege engines. To acquire these tools of war, the Assyrians campaigned farther and farther afield and brought back the spoils of victory. Gold, silver, tin, copper, linen garments with many splendid trimmings, large and small monkeys, ivory, ebony. This, their tribute I received, and they embraced my feet. From his throne in Nineveh, the king knew where the peace was kept and where it was broken. Messengers relayed signals from fire towers or wrote dispatches on clay tablets. In 701 BC, the Assyrian king Sennacherib received troubling word from the province of Judah. Its king refused to pay tribute. Sennacherib was furious. He mobilized his army, tens of thousands strong, then swelled its ranks from states who owed him allegiance. Get together your prefects and the horses of your cavalry immediately. Whoever is late will be impaled in the middle of his house. Before the Assyrians set off, 
priests sacrificed bulls and goats, and the troops prayed to Ishtar, goddess of war. O oh, thou, heroine among the gods, like a bundle, rip him open in the midst of battle. Raise up against him a tempest, an evil wind. At the outset, the Assyrians enjoyed an advantage possessed by few enemies, mobility. They would travel along good roads, maintained by the shovels of prisoners of war. On flat land, they could advance 20 miles a day. The king rode at the front among his cavalry and chariots, followed by his infantry. Behind them all snaked a long supply train where craftsmen made weapons as they rode. In surmounting natural obstacles, especially rivers, the Assyrians reached new heights of ingenuity. Vehicles were carried in large boats, horses swimming behind, troops crossing on inflated animal skins, shields and weapons strapped to their backs. Living off the land, such a host would not have gone far. Because the king had set up huge granaries throughout the empire, his troops could campaign up to 300 miles from a base of supply. Truly could the king of Assyria make his power felt far and wide. Without such supplies, they could not feed the herds of horses so vital to the Assyrian army, whose most feared weapon was the chariot. Like the Egyptians, the Assyrians had improved on the clumsy four-wheeled carts of Babylonia. Massing their two-wheeled chariots like shock troops, they broke an enemy's line and showered it with arrows and spears. Into this chaos, the cavalry, waiting on the flanks, charged. Whoever fled was run down. Whoever remained was picked off by archers and spearmen. But the Assyrians avoided shooting horses. So important were they that the king appointed officials to oversee their capture, mostly taken from northern Iran. As the supply of horses increased, the Assyrians developed a new weapon, as valuable as the chariot, the horseman. At first, he was merely a cheaper version of the charioteer, two men manning two horses. One steered and held a shield, while the other used his bow. Soon, the mounted warrior came into his own. Mobility matched with speed, matched with firepower. Against such a foe, the Judean king Hezekiah dared not risk battle. He retreated within his capital, Jerusalem. All over Judah, his subjects fled to their own towns. Their narrow streets overshadowed by high walls up to 20 feet thick. To withstand the siege that would surely come, Hezekiah dug an underground channel to bring water into Jerusalem. Where the Assyrians could not send their army, they dispatched terror. At Jerusalem, a high Assyrian official strode up to the walls. 
He spoke not to the king and his Jewish commanders in the language of diplomacy, but to the defenders on the battlements in their native Hebrew. I am talking to the people on the wall who will have to eat their excrement and drink their urine. Hezekiah cannot save you. And do not let him persuade you to rely on the Lord. The Emperor of Assyria commands you to surrender. While he delivered this threat, the promise of doom was being fulfilled 30 miles to the south at the town of Lachish. Built astride the trade route to Egypt, Lachish was as strong as it was rich. Behind its steep slopes and high walls, its defenders were confident of holding out. Just as confident, the Assyrians set up their camp behind an oval wall with defensive towers and set about building siege engines. Wooden walls would protect the soldiers inside as they manned an iron battering ram. With it, they would pound the weakest point in the city's walls. Lakish's weak point was its gates. To approach them, the Assyrians first had to erect earthen ramparts covered with timber. Over these, the siege engines were slowly wheeled. The king marshaled his forces. Stone slingers at the rear, then the archers protected by their tall shields. At the very front, the spear carriers who would storm the walls. Together, they advanced safe behind their huge siege engines. The engines themselves, vulnerable to burning arrows, were protected by leather sheaths. A soldier holding a huge ladle would douse any fire that broke out. Below, sappers using iron and bronze tools began to undermine the walls. Above, other soldiers mounted ladders to scale them. No army had so perfected the art of siege. Such an onslaught could not be withstood. When finally the walls were breached, the Assyrians rushed in, shielded by Ishtar goddess of war. Thy face shall not turn green. Thy feet shall not tire. Thy strength shall not fail thee in the heat of battle. Ishtar spoke the truth, but the carnage was unspeakable. of the rebellion were impaled on stakes outside the city, their limp bodies a warning to other Judeans still holding out. King Sennacherib rewarded his soldiers with their share of quivers, daggers, bows, furniture, and goblets. Not all tasted the fruits of victory. 
At Lachish, 1,500 Assyrians, overlooked by Ishtar, would lie together in a mass grave. Meanwhile, King Sennacherib made good his losses and counted his spoils. 200,000 people, great and small, male and female. Horses, mules, camels, asses, cattle and sheep, without number. In Judah, as elsewhere, the Assyrians made sure the spirit of the conquered was indeed broken. They uprooted their subjects by the hundreds of thousands and carried them off into bondage in Assyria. The Bible records that in 721 BC, 30,000 inhabitants of Samaria were thus deported. The Lost Tribes of Israel. As for Hezekiah, the Jew who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong cities, as well as the small cities in their neighborhood, which were without number, by leveling with battering rams and by bringing up siege engines, I did take. In the 50 years after the subjugation of Judah, Assyria pushed its borders to their farthest. In 675 BC, its warriors marched more than a thousand miles and conquered Egypt. Assyria had reached its most glorious height. In its cities, peopled by merchants, craftsmen, artists, and scholars, civilization flourished as it never had. But the Assyrians had overreached. The empire now spanned the whole of the Middle East. Instead of governing its subjects, Assyria terrorized them. The conquered nursed their grudges and bided their time. In 612 BC, Assyria's greatest enemies united and marched on Nineveh. The great city was sacked. A society a thousand years old collapsed and its empire vanished. Fittingly, Assyria would suffer yet one more outrage. Its epitaph would be written by one of its own victims, the prophet Nahum. All who hear the news of your destruction clap their hands for joy. Did no one escape?